Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Josh Sharp and today I will be introducing you and your spouse to the seven principles for making marriage work as outlined by American psychologist John M. Gottman. In emotionally intelligent marriages, a dynamic is established where negative thoughts and feelings are kept from overwhelming the positive ones. In positive sentiment override, things are interpreted in a positive light, uh, whereas in negative sentiment override, a simple request or uh, need that is presented may be interpreted increasingly negative. Thus, working on communication and conflict resolution is not the only decisive factor because happily married couples may have a lot of conflict and may not be quick to validate the other person. The decisive factor in a marriage for Gottman is the positive sentiments overriding the negative ones. Marriages are based on a deep friendship, knowing each other's likes, dislikes, deep hopes and dreams. So, because Gottman strongly believes that at the crux of a marital dissatisfaction is not poor communication skills, he instead encourages couples to nurture their friendship and sense of togetherness, as this is going to be more fruitful. Following the seven principles as detailed by Gottman will help you and your spouse beyond the unhelpful conflict resolution advice that you may have been given. So starting with principle number one is enhance your love maps. So it is understandable that the more familiar you are to your partner, more positive feelings of familiarity that you have, the more intimacy happens. This is called having a love map of your partner. Having a love map is more is important because it helps maintain intimacy and better prepares one to deal with stressful events and conflict. Life cycle transitions such as bringing in children into the family are also better handled as the couple are in touch. But if couples do not start off with a deep knowledge of each other, it's easy for a marriage to lose its way when lives shift suddenly. Those who do not have an adequate love map experience may experience a drop in intimacy in the couple relationship with transition to parenthood. So that being said, there are a few things that Gottman suggests us that we do. First is the love map questionnaire, which is a self-assessment to see how much each partner really knows about the other. Uh, some important things for this exercise is that we do not want to pass judgment on what our spouse tells us or try or try to give the other advice. The main goal here is just to listen and learn more about your partner. Another exercise that he offers us is the Love Map 20 Question Game. Uh, in this game, you are asking the partner to think of things important to them. And this is something I would highly suggest for young couples, especially because it is a lighthearted and is framed in a game style, which encourages both partners to be playful and engage in a fun activity together. Next is principle number two, nurture your fondness and admiration for one another. So, what does this mean? At the basis, you're going to want to work to increase positive emotions about each other. This is important. The fondness and admiration aspects of couple relatedness are the antidote to contempt. It is a buffer to stressors due to a fundamentally positive view of the other. If current relational situations seem negative, the therapist may want to look to the past for positive times slash basis. Fondness and admiration also prevents the four horsemen of criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. So it is easy to understand that without fondness and admiration, the relationship has little, if any, basis at all. 
When you acknowledge and openly discuss positive aspects of your partner and your marriage, your bond is strengthened. This makes it much easier to address the problem areas of your marriage and initiate positive changes. So Gottman offers us some tools to improve our fondness and admiration with our partner. Um, the first is a, another questionnaire, the fondness and admiration questionnaire which helps us to delineate the current state of fondness and admiration that we have. Uh, another great exercise that he offers us is cherishing your partner. And I really like this one. Um, and it's in his book where you are to pick 10 qualities out of a list uh, that you cherish in your partner. And for each one, Note one occasion when your partner has displayed this or showed this to you. Then say to yourself, I am really lucky to be with my partner. Sit with that, then write a love note expressing how much you cherish these qualities in your partner and plan maybe a date where you can read this aloud to them and show some of those feelings towards your partner. That was principle number two. Moving on to principle number three, turn towards each other and not away. So in essence, this principle is based on the idea of staying connected and positively so. Turning towards each other in small interactions builds romance and connection beyond the cushioning of stresses. It is the small and regular interactions of turning towards each other throughout the day. It adds to the emotional bank account and allows for a greater leeway during conflict that you two may engage in. There are two obstacles that impede on our ability to turn towards each other. First, often we may miss a bid from our partner because it is wrapped in anger or other negative emotions that make it hard for us to hear what they're really saying before replying defensively to your partner pause for a moment and search for a bid underneath your partner's harsh words next couples often ignore each other's emotional needs out of mindlessness and not malice so sometimes couples unconsciously it, for example, use devices as self-distraction during marital conflict, which can confuse a lot. So some of the exercises that Gottman requests that couples do in these times, um, one is the emotional bank account, as we were talking about earlier. This is a way of keeping track of what you did to improve your connectedness and subtract things that you did not. And one thing to be careful of is it's not a tit-for-tat uh, way of approaching this. It's um, something to kind of engage in as a team. And a discussion between you two partners can take place as to which tasks will be help, helpful in uh, bettering the couple's connectedness. A list of potential connectedness-oriented tasks may include things like shopping for groceries or cooking together. The goal at the end of the day is to make small improvements by noticing how your partner has been turning toward and giving for the relationship. Now, while these exercises will not forestall every argument, they will foster turning towards each other and thus a deeper friendship, therefore shielding against conflict. On to principle number four is let your partner influence you. So this is important because this principle is meant to be used for a partner who is unwilling to share power or influence in the relationship. This is typically more of a thing we see in males, but females can also have fault too. 81% of couples where the men do not do this will self-destruct. Women tend to match or reduce our negativity in conflict, so, but men tend to escalate it, usually with one of the four horsemen. It, even if this does not happen every argument, it does lead to the 81% self-destructive couples. 
as it obliterates the other's opinion and instead of taking it into account. Some men show latent resistance to have their spouses influencing them. At the end of the day, the point of this principle is to don't argue back at negative statements and instead try to accommodate them. Accepting influence, the issue... The issue is not to express or not express negative emotions, but it is how one would accommodate to them. Accepting influence from your wife reduces her harshness and creates a strong foundation for compromise that leads to easier found solutions. Accepting influence will make it easier for the husband to establish a deeper love map, increase fondness and admiration, and to turn towards each other. Women tend to be more naturally oriented to relationships and emotions, whereas men tend to be more action-oriented. Therefore, men have to make an added effort to learn about emotions and emotional-slash-relational elements of the situation. Gottman calls this emotional intelligence. Learning to yield is an important lesson in life meaning that there are people who regularly run into obstacles and other who will drive around them. Perpetual problems are better identified when the core issues behind the conflict situation are identified and delineated. Working within the delineation of the underlying issues helps the couple not escalate by identifying the real issue, and thus they are better equipped to more truly turn to each other. If a seating power or influence in the relationship is difficult, it's best to acknowledge this disposition so that both partners can work at this issue in a way which is upfront, yes, also comfortable for both. And we're going to go on to principle number five, which is solve your unsolvable problem. If a given disagreement is deemed solvable by both partners, then you as a couple have to try something different than unresolved arguments, screaming, yelling, or angry silences. The classical advice of improving communication or suggestions of try to put yourself in the other shoes do not work because some people are not as good at doing that as other people. Nevertheless, those are not the essential components of happy and loving marriages. Instead, these five principles of problem resolution were found key to happy marriages. First, soften your startup. Arguments tend to end up in the same tonality that they start. Also, couples tend to divorce more because of distancing to avoid the fights than the actual fight. Therefore, it is important to phrase the way you start your disagreement in a soft way. Instead of saying, what's wrong with you, you never take the garbage out, you can say, I am sometimes tired when I get home from work. Could you please help me with the garbage? Part of this is complain is complaining about something but not putting blame on the partner. Additionally, starting statements with I instead of you can be extremely helpful in decreasing that blame. Um, as well as being appreciative of and request of the respect and request that your partner is making. And the next principle here is to learn to make and receive repair attempts. This is good for when noticing that the discussion will end up the wrong way. The essence is that the repair attempts get through to the other partner, not that the repair attempt is elegant. Repair attempts could be missed if not sugar-coated or framed positively. So one should focus on break attempts at the negative negativity escalating situation. Humor is typically helpful as well as announcing an upcoming repair attempt ahead of time. Identifying potent repair statements is like megaphones for the repair attempts. And some of these may include, I feel I am getting scared. This is important to me. I would like you to listen. Uh, And 
that brings us to our next principle for conflict resolution, which is soothe yourself and each other. Some couples can self-soothe as part of a discussion. Others cannot, as they flood fast and thus repair attempts are missed. Taking a break in a fight will help you calm down enough to not withdraw completely. <clears throat> Some of the things you can discuss before a conflict comes away comes in your way is what floods your partner or you. Uh, is there anything that your partner can do to soothe you? Um, what signals can we use to let others know that we're flooded? And can we take a break? Next, compromise is going to be very helpful as negotiation is nice. It only, but it only works if there is a softening startup. Also, one cannot be close to or disagree with everything that the spouse says. Men tend to have a harder time accepting influence of their partners than vice versa. Exercises in finding common ground will help the partners engage in this activity as it is something that is going to come up often. Lastly, be tolerant of each other's faults. You cannot change your partner, and if you think you can, then compromise will never happen. On to our second to last principle, principle number six, overcoming gridlock. This one is really important because gridlock happens when people's life dreams, hopes, aspirations for their life are not being addressed or respected by their partner. Such deep dreams can include an experience of peace, exploration of who you are, justice, healing, spirituality. When dreams are respected, couples are happier as they realize that marriage is supposed to help them with those dreams and not manipulate the other out of achieving the goal. The couple that knows that the marriage is meant to help with each other's dreams and thus is able to forego dreams with the knowledge that it, it, its aspirations will be acknowledged and considered later. There are such things as hidden dreams. Hidden dreams typically only emerge in the relationship after the marriage feels safe. When you get to expose your dream and it seems as if your dream is in office, opposition to the others, tension seems to escalate at first, but there's a process. So first, we want to become dream detectives. So even if someone gives up a dream for the marriage, some people may, minim some people may minimize that dream as childish or impractical, but the dream will resurface in a disguised form as a gridlock conflict. Next, once the gridlock issue comes up, we need to work on it. This means spelling out the issue where the dreams come from. Don't argue or criticize the other dreams, but instead just try to understand why you or your partner feels that way. Speaker's job is to describe your position and what it means to you, and the listener's job is to hear the other person's dream and encourage its exploration. Suspending rebuttals or judgment, you want to honor your partner's dream, not triumph them and crush your partner. Step three, soothe each other. This is similar to the last principle, but dreams in opposition can be stressful. So instead of pushing forward, take a break for soothing as flooding will achieve nothing. Step number four to ending the gridlock at the end of the day, you'll never be able to fully resolve the conflict, but reduce some of its tensions. Finding things that you can compromise on while others which you cannot compromise on will help you decide and understand the partner and your conflicts better. The goal is to delineate the core issues, delineate the areas of flexibility, and then arrive at temporary compromises. The conflict will still be ongoing, but not as gridlocked. 
Lastly, step five is simple, say thank you. Lastly, principle number seven, creating shared meaning. One can have a happy marriage, but some people look for a spiritual connection, finding meaning in the togetherness beyond the mere joint tasks of family life. Symbols and rituals are helpful. There is a family culture which gives shared meaning to their sense of togetherness. There may be dreams that each partner has which cannot work well together with the other partner's dreams, but the shared meaning couple looks beyond that. This couple discusses convictions in a way which blends each other's sense of meaning. A discussion of core values can be used to further the couple's shared meaning. The shared meaning will strengthen the marital friendship in a numerous amount of ways. One thing to consider are family rituals. Not many families have family dinners and those who do often use the television. Thus, no conversation could happen. Shared meaning could be created around dinner, but each family could develop their own ritual. A rituals exercise can help the couple or family work out rituals issues, such as on how to eat dinner, holidays, keeping in touch with relatives, how to celebrate positive and negative events. Next, another thing to discuss with your partner is your roles in life. A great question to ask or think about is their congruence between each partner's roles, values, and views. Therefore, values have to be discussed beyond superficiality of apparent congruency in order to work out significant value differences. Next, personal goals are important to discuss and they're sometimes not delineated clearly to oneself or the other partner. So talking about it together helps to kind of shape those goals together as a team. Lastly, shared symbols are symbols which have shared relational meaning to each of you. This can be uh, as simple as giving your partner a piece of gum or uh, a rainbow that you both cherish and you both cherish rainbows recognizing those things and seeing them for the value that they have is vitally important. So now that we've covered the seven principles of making marriage work, I have to say marriage is a lifelong goal of building a relationship, way of loving and lifestyle that you and your partner dream about. Your marriages with the person sitting next to you will be tested throughout time. Thus, arguments or disagreements are inevitable. But with these seven principles, you couples are better equipped to weather the storm of marital conflict and hopefully improve the level of engagement and love that you have for one another. Thank you.